Today's event is my dear friend who I met in January, February, I think. Um, this is Beth Riccanati. And a funny story, I think some of you guys have heard it already, but we met on Instagram. <laughs> so there are some positives to social media. The positive with Beth is that um, I was following her. She goes by the moniker or the name um, at House Calls for Wellness. And I was following all of her stuff, and it was really very insightful in mind you know, made me, made me think, and I really love them. And so one day I clicked on her website, and then she had said all these things on her website that um, we had in common. She was a physician. She's now doing health and wellness things. And we email and text with each other, and we've been consulting with each other and whatnot. So Beth has this book, Rated, A Journey of a Thousand Kalas. At Kalas. Um, <laughs> I can't and, get um, general, but. It's um, kind of her, her message for all of us, I think, to live a, a more mindful life in the frenzy of raising children and being a doctor and being a wife and being a friend, she found that the, it was calming, uh, it was a, calm, a calming ritual to make challah in her home on Fridays. So I'm gonna let Beth take it away. Oh, oh, one more thing. Her book is on sale here in the uh, dining area. After the event, Beth will sign anything you want. They're great holiday gifts holi with Hanukkah and Christmas coming up. So feel free to to purchase them. So, Thank you. And then there's challah here to taste, and she's going to sh do a whole demo on challah making, too. Good morning. Good morning. It's Good such morning. a treat to be here. Would you think I'm crazy if I told you, though, that the reason I'm here is to tell you a story, the story of how my life has been irrevocably changed, maybe even saved, by a loaf of white bread. <laughs> <laughs> and I do mean white bread. It's the bread that's sitting on the, the table over there. So I've been making challah now for a decade. Well, uh, probably now a little more than a decade. And I make it every Friday, almost every Friday. <laughs> um, and the reason that I make it and continue to make it is that it really has changed my life. And I ultimately realized that this was going on and that I was feeling better and I was in a healthier place. So I kept doing it. I kept coming back to the kitchen counter because I felt better. And that's what I'm hoping to share with you all today, sort of how that happened and, and why that happened. There's a whole body of research around the tactile arts. And I think there's a lot of truth to this now that I have found myself immersed in kneading dough. Um, whether you're knitting or um, pottery, maybe you, maybe you throw, throw clay. Um, I knead, I bake um, hollow. That's actually all I bake, but, but I, I, ba <laughs> I bake bread. Um, there's something about when you're in using your hands that the research has shown, and I've certainly found for myself to be true, that we feel calmer and we feel more present. And what's really great about activities like knitting or baking bread is they can be done as a community. They can be done together with groups. And what's great about that is not only then are you feeling better, but you're decreasing your sense of loneliness. And we don't always realize that we are, in fact, lonely. But Many of us are, and there's something really wonderful about coming together around a kitchen counter to combat that. And I've certainly found that through, through making challah. You know, they have it right. When, you, when you're on an airplane, I, was, I flew up here yesterday, and the, uh, the flight attendant, Holly, this is not Holly, but, but Holly, <laughs> as the pilot was announcing, you know, the, the main cabin door has been closed, please power down your electronics. She stood there with the seatbelt extender and the safety placard, and my favorite, the oxygen mask. And what I love about this reminder, and, and she went through it with us yesterday, she said to us, in case of an emergency, in case of a loss of cabin pressure, be sure to put your oxygen mask on yourself first, and then those around you. You know, I bet many of us in this room are caregivers. You know, I have kids, I have a job, I have a husband, I have a dog, like, well, I'm a caregiver. And I bet many of you are too, and what many of us do is we forget to put our oxygen masks on ourselves first. We put them on everybody. I mean, we, we take care of everyone else. But it's hard to take care of everybody else if you don't have enough to give. So I love the reminder that, that Holly gave us yesterday, um, and that this nice gentleman is reminding us, that, that it's important to put your oxygen mask on first. So my goal for today is to A, talk for a little bit, and then B, give you a, a demonstration of how I do this on Fridays and then answer some, some questions. So that, that's sort of the layout. But what I'm hoping that, that you'll get from 
from our time together is how this is how making Hala has become my oxygen mask, and maybe it will be for you all as well. Okay, so I'm often asked, why? Why did you write a book about bread? You're a doctor, and this is white bread. And it's a great question, and I love the question. Um, and that's what I'm about to, to try and answer. First and foremost, it's not just a book about bread. Certainly, it's about challah, and hopefully by the end of reading it, you will be able, if you choose, to make challah. But it's actually a book about my journey. It's a book about finding meaning and finding a way to try and be a little bit more present and grounded in this crazy world of ours. It's a book about, about finding some, some health actually, and how I realized through this, this ritual that I was engaging in every week that, that there are actually a lot of health benefits. It's not why I set out to make challah, but, but it's what I've learned, which I think is, is really great. So come back with me, if you will. Let me take you back to where I was 10 years ago so you can understand the, I can set the stage for how all this came to be. I was a completely stressed out mom 10 years ago. We had three young kids. I somehow thought it was a great idea to have three kids in four years. I, I, it, was, it was, for me, not a great idea at the time. It was, it was overwhelming. And I was working, I was at the Cleveland Clinic then, I had a big job, and I, I was trying to balance that and take care of the kids. And I was here when I should have been there, and it just was hard. It was really hard. I was, one day, in fact, I was sitting in our family room in Cleveland. I was on the, the floor, and our daughter, Mia, our youngest, toddled over to me. She was about three, probably, and she starts patting me on the head. And she says, as only a toddler can say, Mommy, why do you look like a grandma? <laughs> <laughs> what? I wasn't yet 40. I was like, it was, it was not a good moment. And, and I looked at her, and I'm like, what are you talking about? And, and she's patting my head. And I had a Cruella de Vil white streak. I had that year, I was so stressed out at, at my job and with everything going on that I had developed, like, on a dime, this white streak. I was wearing my stress, which can happen. We can wear our stress. It's physical. And I just had not been, been paying attention. You know, it's, it's hard to multitask and do it well. And, and I was trying to do that, and I was failing miserably. Um, in fact, I actually thought at that time that, and this is crazy, I thought it was okay to run in place in my bathroom at night to get those 10,000 steps. <laughs> because I was spending my days at the clinic telling my patients, well, you need 10,000 steps a day. And by the way, I actually really believe in that recommendation. As an aside, I think it's great. The American Heart Association does have a recommendation that we all get 10,000 steps a day. And it's great, because heart disease is the number one killer of women. It was 10 years ago when I was practicing there, and it is today. And that's frustrating. But the good news is that, that there are lots of lifestyle things that we can do about that. And I thought this was such a simple thing. I'll just tell my patients to get 10,000 steps a day. I'll do it too. It's hard. <laughs> like, I don't know how many of you wear pedometers or have Fitbits or have an app on your phone, but it takes real forethought to get 10,000 steps a day. And I wasn't doing it. I mean, my job was really sedentary, and, and I was just driving to and from work. So. I, it wasn't happening. So I thought, this is great. It's 11 o'clock at night. I will, the, you know, the kids are in bed, and the dishes are done, and the permission slip signed, and the lunch box is packed, and you know, the Legos put away. It's great. I'll just run in place <laughs> in my bathroom. It was not a good, it was not good. And luckily, I was talking um, that fall. It was right before the, before the Jewish New Year. Sorry, I'm, saying, I'm not used to this. <laughs> and I was, I was talking with my friend Abby in New York, and she said to me, you should make challah. I was like, OK. She said, no, it's, I'm making it next week for, for Rosh Hashanah. You, you should try it. I'll send you the recipe. It's really simple. And by the way, if you tried the challah over there, it is that recipe, and it is really simple. It's from the JCC in Manhattan. And it was for a mommy and me class that she had just attended with her um, two or three-year-old son. So it's really simple. And I'll go over it with you all in a little bit, and you'll see. I mean, it's, it's basic. So she said, you should make challah. I was like, well, that's really great, but uh, I don't bake. I don't bake anything. Um, well, that's not true. At the time, I was making brownies, you know, the kind in the box, the Giardelli, <laughs> you know, that you add the, the egg and the oil. And yeah, I did that really well. I had a beautiful ceramic dish from our wedding. I would bake it in the white dish and think I was so cool. Um, <laughs> but that was, like, I didn't bake. But I don't know, something about what Abby said that day, it really spoke to me, and I don't know exactly how or why, but, but, but I did it. 
I made challah, and it was the coolest thing because I just stopped. You know, when you're at the kitchen counter with your six ingredients and a bowl, you're not on your Blackberry. I used to be on my Blackberry a lot. Remember those? Like, I used to love my Blackberry. And I couldn't send an email, and I couldn't be folding laundry, and I couldn't be putting away toys. Like, I just was at the kitchen counter. And it was really fabulous for 20 minutes. And I loved it. And then I put them in the oven. And, and you may have noticed when you walked in, there's that aroma. I was hooked. You know, a couple hours later, I opened the oven door, having never baked anything, and so I didn't understand the, how your house can smell. <laughs> and, and it was a home. It was the most incredible thing. I had, and I had done it. I was hooked. I did it again the next week, and again, and again, and again, and we're 10 years later and over a thousand halas, and a book, thanks, over there. Um, and it was really, really great. I was completely enthralled with making hala. But, why does it really matter? I mean, at the end of the day, like, why, like, so what? It's bread. Why does it matter? I think it matters because, you know, I certainly know as a physician, but honestly, we all know in this room, that stress makes us sick. It, it can make us sick. It doesn't always. But, but it can make us sick. And it's really important to have, have a way to address that. And I was learning that, that this was working for me. I read an article uh, probably about six months ago now um, in the New York Times, an op-ed by a behavioral scientist, Clay Rutledge, and I was profoundly struck by what he said. He wrote about, I mean, he was writing about suicide and depression, but, but he wrote about how we're in a time of crisis, and we're really, um, as a society, we, we've lost our way a bit. And I could really identify with, with that article. He talked about how this lack of meaning has, has resulted in so much stress and a sense of anxiety and a sense of being overwhelmed. And I thought, yeah, I'm stressed and I, I'm overwhelmed and, and I'm anxious and I really got what he was saying. And he went on to posit such a simple solution. And he said, you know, if you just, if you just put some meaning back in your life, if you, if you have a ritual in your life, you really can start to address in a very simple way all of this, this malaise and uneasiness. And I thought, wow, he's right, and I'm going to keep making hala because it, it's my meaningful ritual. And I think that's really, really important. So luckily, the recipe worked um, <laughs> that first time <laughs> 10 years ago. And, and luckily, I kept doing it um, because I learned after a couple years at this that I had three big takeaways, and that's what I want to share with you all now. Um, I learned three lessons that I'm continuing, by the way, to learn and to, to grow with. One, I learned the power of having a meaningful ritual. Two, I learned the power of community. And three, I really learned the power of thinking about food as medicine. So what do I mean? Let's start with the power of a meaningful ritual. The great thing about making hala for me is that I have to show up every Friday in time and space at my kitchen counter every Friday. And what I finally realized, by, because I was doing this every Friday, was that I was getting a lot of benefit from it, benefit that I hadn't realized. And the benefits were spilling out over the course of the week. So I was noticing that because I felt more present on that Friday at that kitchen counter, I was able to transfer that over the course of the week. And it was really great to feel better, which it became a virtuous cycle, a virtuous circle. Um, I'm not sure what that is, right? It's not a vicious cycle. It's the opposite of that. Um, because I felt good, I wanted to do it again. And because I was doing it again, I felt good. So I wanted to do it. It was this wonderful um, pattern I was, I was falling into. And it has to do with something. This is supposed to be a brain, by the way. Um, I want to talk about neuroplasticity for a minute. So um, it is a brain, but it's hard to, it's hard to tell. So I, I had been um, introduced to some ideas um, by a researcher named Carol Dweck. She's actually here at Stanford, so maybe some of you are aware, aware of her. Um, our kids' school um, talk a lot about her ideas. And what I realized was this meaningful ritual for me really came back to this idea of neuroplasticity. And she writes a lot about something called the growth mindset. And it's really great that um, we're not fixed. Like Our ideas, our thoughts, and our behaviors they're not fixed, they can change. And she talks a lot about the word yet. And 
I wasn't a baker yet, and I didn't have a meaningful ritual yet, and I certainly didn't have a way to manage my stress 10 years ago. But the way she talks about how we can grow and change and learn has really um, sparked within me, and I, and I come back to it a lot. I love that idea of yet, like nothing's set in stone. It's a great idea um, of hers, I think. And it's really incredible, actually. She, she talks about how, well, a lot of researchers around neuroplasticity talk about how you have an idea, you trigger a neuron, and you start forming these, these neural neuro connections. And the more you do something, the stronger the connection gets. So when I show up at the kitchen counter on a Friday, I'm strengthening a neuro connection, and it gets easier. And before I know it, it's become a pattern, and I've changed my behavior. And I think that's really really great. Now, obviously, not all, neuro, not all neuro connections are great. I mean, in high school, I ate a lot of ice cream when I was stressed <laughs> out. And, and I was, you know, I got stressed, I ate ice cream, I got stressed, I got it. And I was forming, um, unfortunately, a bad habit. But habits are habits. Um, so you do have to think about, about what kind of change you, you're, you're working on. Um, but challah for me has, making challah for me has certainly become a, a meaningful ritual. The second idea that I want to speak about for a minute is the power of community. And when I talk about community, I mean two, two things. I mean one, building community, and two, sustaining community. So when I first made challah, I made it by myself. Abby gave me the recipe. We were in Cleveland. I was, it was me, myself, and I in the kitchen counter. But then we moved to Los Angeles, and the kids were a bit older, and they started inviting their friends for dinner on Friday nights. And then their friends wanted to learn. Well, they wanted their mothers to learn how to make challah. <laughs> and, and it became a thing. And now I make challah, not every Friday with other women, but often with other women. And we're building a community, sort of one friendship at a time. And I think that's incredible. And it harkens back, actually, to what I said at the beginning about the benefit of the tactile arts. And one of them is the sense of community and, and doing things together. Um, it's, it's a healthy behavior. Um, so that's building community, but sustaining community. So I grew up very reform um, in terms of my Jewish education. I really, I, we celebrated Christmas, I knew nothing. And I did not appreciate anything about the history of Hala. Certainly I did not appreciate. It's been made for 4,000 years. I think that's really great. Like we're still making Hala and it's been made since, since the beginning of, of all of Jewish, Jewish time. Um, or at least that's what the Talmud says. <laughs> so I'll go with that. But, but what I think is really interesting about when I talk about sustaining is that I'm making it in LA, and I know tomorrow that my friend Meredith is going to make it in New York, and I have a new friend, thanks to Instagram, besides Jeannie, I have a new friend in London now who is making her challah on Fridays, and, and there's Miriam I know in Tel Aviv who's making challah. And you know, it's a kind of a stressed out world right now that we're living in. It's a little bit like times are a little bit difficult and I love to think when I am particularly feeling stressed as the events of this week ha have again shown us mm -hmm. that um, it's great that the world's actually not so so large and scary and fraught because we're all doing all these women I know or even some men around the world are doing the same activity every week and it connects us and I think that's really cool so I like to think about that when I'm making hala on Fridays And there's a picture. I, I was supposed to advance the slides. Um, but this is, these are um, different women and communities that, that I've made hollow with recently, um, which is fun. OK, the third, the third uh, lesson is really around this idea of food as medicine. When I went to medical school about 25 years ago, I think we had an hour of nutrition. And that might be generous. Like, we really had no education around nutrition, which is, is sobering, and I'm glad that it's changing now. Um, and I didn't really learn much about food and health and nutrition from a medical point of view until my most recent job at the Cleveland Clinic when I was running a program to treat chronic diseases through lifestyle. And it was a program that was based in large part on the work of research, researchers such as Dean Ornish, who've looked at cardiovascular disease and prostate cancer and things like that, and lifestyle modification. And the results are really impressive. You can change what you eat, you can change how you move, you can change how you manage stress, and you can change your health, which I think is incredible. Um, so we were really lucky as part of that uh, team that I had to have a dietitian on staff. And she's the one who really began to educate me. She took us grocery shopping 
early on in the start of this, this program. I'd been grocery shopping on my own by then for probably 20 years. I, I really thought I knew how to grocery shop. Like you go in the store, you buy what you need, and you leave. <laughs> no, no, I was wrong. She explained to us, as some of you may know this, you're supposed to walk the perimeter and not as much down the, the center aisles because the perimeter has all the fresh fruits and vegetables and all the, the great protein and the eggs and the, the fish and, and the center has the Doritos and the, the microwave popcorn and the crackers and the chips and the, the stuff you really don't want to be eating. So I was grateful for that lesson, although it was very humbling. Um, <laughs> but it was good. She walked us down the bread aisle in particular and she pulled out a, a loaf of sandwich bread. I don't mean the beautiful artisanal bread that you see when you first walk into the grocery store and the beautiful cornucopia that, that looks lovely. No, she pulled out like a Wonder White or something like that. And she turned it around and she showed us the label and she said, you know, take a good look. Like, do you know what this is? And um, I love to quote Michael Pollan when I talk about, about how she then went on to explain about the, the label. So Michael Pollan is a food policy food uh, writer, author, and he's, he's written a lot of books. But I love this, this quotation, and then I'll get back to what the dietitian said. Um, Don't eat anything your grandmother wouldn't recognize as food. So there the dietitian is holding up this loaf of white bread, and she's asking us to read the label, which, by the way, takes up the entire side of the back of the, the loaf of white bread. And she went through the, the ingredients, or the ones that we couldn't pronounce, and she talked about chemicals and additives and things to avoid, and it really, started me thinking about how some foods are so incredibly healing and some foods are not. So she, in that case, she was talking about things like high fructose corn syrup and, and all the chemicals and additives and things like that and things to avoid. Um, she then went on, and, I, and I've since learned a lot about actually foods that are healing. So things like ginger and turmeric spices and, and things like that. But it was really the beginning for me of an education about thinking about food as, as medicine and how it can help you and it can hurt you. And I think about that now on Fridays. It's still the same recipe from 10 years ago. It's still the one from the Mommy and Me class at the JCC. But I've altered the quality of some of the ingredients now that I know more. So for example, the egg. I, try this experiment at home if, if you've never done something like this. Go buy the cheapest egg you can find and then go find the most expensive egg egg you can find and take two bowls and crack one egg in one bowl and one egg in the other bowl and it's astounding. On the one hand, the cheap egg, it's pale and anemic and it doesn't look very good. And then you get the, the expensive one, it's usually the organic cage-free pasture raised etc egg and it's almost saffron gold, the yolk of that egg. I mean, don't you want to put that in your body? I know I do. I want all those good nutrients. So I've changed up the quality of the ingredients as a result of learning about how food, food is medicine, um, which I think is great. I was reminded that day in the uh, grocery store, and I'm reminded when I make the bread, about the power of keeping it simple. So that bread that I don't even know, well, the, the sandwich bread, know what's in it. It had a laundry list of ingredients. The beautiful thing that I'm reminded about on Fridays is keeping it simple. This recipe just has six ingredients, and I actually can pronounce them all. It's <laughs> flour, sugar, eggs, oil, salt, and yeast. Oh, and water to proof the yeast, so I guess it's really seven. But that's it, and it's a great reminder to keep it simple. I really like that. Um, and I like that it reminds me, um, this is a picture uh, on Friday night before we say the prayers. Um, I like that, that making the challah is, is really just behavioral modification. So thinking about meaningful rituals and thinking about community and thinking about food as medicine, all of those really fall under the rubric of behavioral modification. And we used to talk a lot in my practice at the Cleveland Clinic um, in, that, in that program. We were just really trying to get people to modify their behavior at the end of the day. And you can do something for a month, and most likely you'll change your behavior. So if I ask you, Erica, to, to start exercising, and I want you to walk for 30 minutes a day, if you do it for nine days, 
I don't know, maybe you'll do it on the 10th. If you, I mean, if you skip the 10th, maybe you'll do it on the 11th, but you might not. But if I ask you, Amy, <laughs> to, do, to do it for the 28 days, and you do it for the 28 days. That'd be a miracle. <laughs> 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 a miracle is going to happen. But if, but, if, but if you skip the, the 29th day, you'll think about it. You'll be totally on the you missed, and you might even go back and do it the next day. So that's essentially all that I've done here. I made bread for essentially 28 Fridays, and I kept making it. Because when I don't, I miss it. So I make it when I travel, usually. And we have an 11th commandment in our house that thou shalt always have a frozen challah in the freezer. Because sometimes I don't make it. There is that lapse occasionally. Like, my kids will pull one out of the freezer tomorrow night, because I'll still be here. But I make it mostly every Friday, because I think that it's become part of, of what I do now, which is fantastic. So about five years ago, I decided I wanted to write a book. Um, I'd never written a book. I, that was all, all new to me. But I wanted to share some of these lessons. And I thought the best way to do that would, would be through a book. So at first I thought, okay, I'll write a memoir. I'll just, I'll share my story. And so I wrote, that's what I did. I wrote a memoir. But the problem with just writing a strict memoir was that I was missing the history piece and I was missing some of the medical piece that I wanted to throw in and that it didn't feel complete. So then I thought, okay, I'll write a cookbook because I mean, it's hala. It's I'm cooking, but there's one recipe. <laughs> so yeah, that's not such a good cookbook. So so then I thought, okay, I'll do the doctor thing and and I'll write a self-help book because I mean, don't doctors write self-help books? So I I tried to do that, but it was really boring to to write and it was really boring to read and I realized <laughs> that a standalone self-help book wasn't going to do it. So what I actually have done and, and what the book is, it's those three threads braided together, excuse the pun, but I couldn't resist. Um, but it's, so it's part memoir, it's part cookbook, and it's part um, health and wellness, sort of how to do all of this together. And within the book itself, there are actually also three themes. There's the history of Hala, which I'm actually going to go over a bit when we do the demo in a second, um, because I think it's really cool. I got to go to Israel about five years ago, and while I was there, I, I got to learn sort of the history and the background of, of Hala, and there's a lot there that I didn't appreciate, which I think is kind of special. Um, so there's the history, and then there's a lot about food, obviously, um, both the recipe and then the ingredients themselves and why I use what I use, and, and and why all that matters. And then there's uh, the mom and medical stories, because I'm a mom and a doctor. Um, so what I want to do now, actually, is just read one short passage. And then Jeannie and I are going to change this up for a second, and then, and then do the demonstration. The act of making the bread, the mixing and the kneading, the watching and the waiting, can heal your heartache and your emptiness, your sense of being overwhelmed. It did for me. You could bake bread once a week, every week. I did. You can make it alone or with others, like I have done. The smell of fresh baking bread turned our house into a home. So go ahead, get down those ingredients, grab a bowl, and call me in the morning. I'd love to hear how you are doing. <laughs> so, thank you. So, thank you. Can we try and move this? I'm going to do a quick demo in a moment. It's, it's like it's a TV style demo. We're going to have ingredients, dough, <laughs> bread. OK, I instant, instant, uh, instant makeover. So the really cool thing about, about making hala is that it is steeped in all of these rituals. And these, um, there are all kinds of blessings around it. And that's really what I, what I want to talk about now. There are three blessings. There's a blessing. Um, before you make the challah that I, itself that I'm going to go into. There's a blessing before you braid the challah. And then once it's actually fully baked, there's a blessing before you have it on Friday night. But I just learned um, from Miriam, my new friend in Tel Aviv, there's actually a fourth blessing, which I had not appreciated, which is just the fact of making challah. It's one of the mitzvahs. There, there are uh, 613 commandments or, or mitzvahs that that um, have been described, and, w and one of them is, is actually just making challah. So the very fact that we made challah today is a mitzvah. Blessed your home. It's all kind of cool. <laughs> so, so I like that. Um, so this is it. These are all the ingredients to make challah. It's really this simple. And um, one of the really great things I learned in Israel about making challah is that before you, you actually make challah, you can take the moment and think about 
somebody or something that you want to make it in the merit of. And I think that is so incredible. So I used to start doing, when I started that initially, I just would pick just something going on that week and I would say to myself, like I, one of the kids had a math test or um, something was going on at, at work or, or whatever. I just would, would say something to myself. But then I, I started th actually thinking about it and now I say it out loud because I really believe that if you say something with intention and you put it out there in the universe, that actually good things come. So I do that whether I'm alone and I'm sure I look like an idiot, but but I say it out loud, and I do it when I'm with other women. And what's really great about doing that when I make challah with other women, you're, just imagine for a moment, you're around the table, and if you're all thinking about why or who, who, who you're making in the merit of, and you start to share those stories, it's a really fast way to connect and, and, to, and to really be f present and focused. So I really like that. So today I made the merit, I made, made the merit, I made the dough, the first one in the merit of Jeannie and being here and our friendship, so thank you. And then I made the second one actually because um, I just heard the news of um, unfortunately another shooting in Los in outside of Los Angeles last night. So that was for, for, for those families. So I was trying to hopefully do, do a little tikkun alum, repair the world. Um, so that's making it in the merit of. The next opportunity for blessing, which I think is, is um, really amazing, this I had no idea about. This is actually, what I'm about to do now is really what challah is, and that's just bread. And I did not know that or appreciate that or have any idea about that until I started down this path. So um, the mitzvah is the mitzvah of the separation, oh, this feels good, the mitzvah of the separation of the dough, of the challah. What you're left with is just braided bread, really. So when there was a temple and there were, you, they made an offering, um, they made, there was a certain amount, it's in the Talmud, there's a certain weight of dough that was made as an offering. And that's why actually sometimes at Shabbat tables, of, of a, uh, you'll see salt on the table as well because that's supposed to symbolize the offering and at the temple. But we don't have a temple today. There's no temple. So what, what, um, what we do instead is we take a little bit off and we say a blessing to honor the separation of the challah and then we throw this away, we get rid of it. In fact, if you're observant, you burn it. I'm too afraid to try that, I don't burn it. I just wrap it up and I throw it in the trash can once I say the blessing. Now, I'm technically not being halakhic or, or um, doing this as an Orthodox woman would do because the instruction in the Talmud is that you have to use five pounds of flour. So you have to make a lot of challah, and, <laughs> and I don't do that. I, I'm, the recipe that's in the book makes two loaves, the size of the uncut loaf up there. It makes two of those, or it makes one big six braided loaf, or what I'm going to quickly show you here is how to do a braided round loaf. Um, so there are lots of different shapes you can do, but it doesn't make a lot. But, but if you make the five pound worth, then according to the Talmud, you can perform the mitzvah of the separation of the challah. I like to do it anyway. I feel better for doing it. I do it. So, <laughs> so be it. But I know if, if, I, were, if I were truly um, orthodox, that, that would be a problem for me to be doing it this way. So what I want to show you now is how to do a round hollow. So there are different shapes of hollow. And normally on a Friday night, I just make the two braided, the, the two braided loaves. You need to have two at your Shabbat table. Does anybody know why? Does anybody know why you need two? Loaves. Okay, so um, it goes back to the time when the Jews were in the desert and the manna from heaven. You've got one every night, but because of Shabbat, there was, you can't work on Saturday, so they got two on Friday. So you have two, which I think is kind of neat. So we, so we have two. I don't usually make the six braided. I write about it in the book. It's really hard for me. I mean, I think it's good enough that, that I can stop and make the dough, but to make the six braided, you have to really stop and focus and like, it's hard. I've done it and, and I find it really challenging. So I don't, I don't usually do that. What I do instead for the most of the year is make uh, two three braided loaves. And then at the new year, at Rosh Hashanah, I make a round and I finally figured out how to make a round. I used to coil it and I didn't realize that it actually, the temperature and things like this matter because I'm not a baker and I didn't really know that because the rounds are thicker, 
that it matters. <laughs> and I learned the hard way when I served a raw challah that, um, <laughs> yeah, that was embarrassing. But, but I learned that, that it matters. So 195 degrees is the temperature it should be if you're making a, a six braided, a big thick one, or you're making a big round one. So what I have also learned is how to do it better. So I'm gonna show you right now. I do a braid to make my rounds, and I do this just at the new year. But uh, women often do this once a month at Rosh Hodesh, which is the, the beginning of the Jewish month. It's called Rosh Hodesh. And so sometimes you'll see round halas done there. And then you'll see different shapes throughout the year. Like sometimes like at Purim, you might see hala in the shape of um, a triangle, like, like, a, like Haman's hat, like a homentashen. Or you might see when the tablets uh, were given, you might see hala in the shape of the two tablets. So they're all different shapes during the year that have different meaning, which I think is really cool. So what I like to do to make, now I have to think about How it. How long ahead did you make your dough? Um, this dough we made a couple hours ago, but usually I let it rise just for about an hour and a half. Um, you can do two rises. I do one. Abby told me the first day that she did one, so I did one. So I do one. But I know that, that some women do too. So what I'm doing now is just, I'm going to just tilt this a little bit and I won't get flour, I promise. Um, I'm going to make a braided round. So I just do a crisscross, like if you ever made a... Um, a potholder when you were little. You know, this, <laughs> this is what it reminds me of, of when I made potholders. And then you just go in a circle all the way around. It's, it's pretty cool how it works. You go one way and then you go back the other way. And if you think about it, it doesn't work. You just have to do it and, and it works. And you go around. And actually what I like to do is add apples and honey to the ones at the new year because for a sweet new year. Otherwise I make plain hala, but I'm thinking I have to change that because I'm learning all these fun things from people, but, and there you go. And you have a yeah. hello. So, yeah. I would love to answer some questions, if you all have any. Yes? Um, so, you put that bread, and do you put butter on it, or why does everybody need it? Just with your salad, or? Well, we serve it, so at the beginning of, of the Shabbat meal, we say three blessings, one for the candles, one for the wine, and one for the challah. And that's usually when we eat the majority of the challah, but I usually have a lot of teenagers, teenagers at my table, so we then leave it just on the table and everybody eats. You could, I think you probably do anything you want. I mean, we just eat it, but, but sure. Like, it's great the next day. I certainly have it with butter toasted the next day, yeah. if there's any left over. That's the best. Yeah, that's the best. Yeah. Yeah, I make stuffing at Thanksgiving now with challah. So, yeah. Yeah. Yes? I'm sure you're going to talk about your I will talk about it right now for you, sure. And then I have another so, question. Yeah. Question when do you open the wine? Because I have this thing that is probably like, kind of like one of my bad habits. I'll just give it to you all. It's really hard for me to cook without drinking some wine. <laughs> <laughs> so if I started up this tradition, what could I do instead of like popping the pot? <laughs> 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 it's a Friday. Yeah. Yeah. I think she drinks yeah. it. I think she drinks it. Yeah. Those are great questions. So in, ter in terms of the rising, um, I, the, the recipe, you can do a one or two rise. I'm not sure if that's what you're asking, but interrupt me if I'm not answering your question. So that, that is a great question because it just depends. If I've got it down now to, a, it, I can do this in about two to three hours max. And so I just fit it in. Some mornings I get up early, some mornings I make it at lunch, some mornings I make it literally, at, we're taking it out of the oven to say the prayer. And I'm cutting it like with the steam in my face. Um, it doesn't matter when. I have friends who make it Thursday night and they refrigerate the dough and then they, uh, make it Friday. Um, I have another friend, I just, I just met someone this week who, she makes it Wednesday, she freezes it, and then she bakes it Friday. I mean, so, however it fits into your life, that's the beauty of it. It just, it doesn't, it, there's not like a right time. Yeah, you can, you can. Um, as for the drinking of the wine, I mean, <laughs> uh, you, in theory, you don't drink till you say the blessing. Um, <laughs> But yeah, it depends on how, I mean, like, I've certainly been known to drink wine before we say the blessing, so, you know, I'm not orthodox. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just curious, you said you grew up very reformed, yeah. but it sounds as though you're more observant now because you do. We are. We're conservative now. My husband was. Change? When we had kids, it changed. Um, I really, what I loved about 
uh, um, Judaism as I had kids was that it provides such a great framework for how to raise children. I find that really helpful. So we started moving. My, my husband had grown up very, very conservative, and I'd grown up very, very reform, and we sort of, we've met sort of in the middle. So but I the <laughs> No, but the, what the challah brought to us was Shabbat. So now we do have Shabbat, which is really lovely. It's such a great touch point to the week, and it brings everyone back to the table, which I like. Um, we didn't have that before, no. So, someone had a hand up over here, I thought. Yeah. How do you make it more moist? Add more fat? Or? <sighs> to make more it more moist? More rich. Or more, or more, more, you know. Yeah. I am so afraid to touch this recipe yeah. that okay. I don't <laughs> touch this recipe, but I know that... Th oh, right. So you can add all kinds of things. So you, um, we've got chocolate, uh, no, we've got raisins over here and cinnamon. You can add chocolate. You can add, I, a friend of mine made pumpkin hollow last week at, at, thing, at uh, Halloween, which she's going to do for Thanksgiving. You can make all kinds of sweet or savory to your heart's content. It's, it's really great, actually, if you want to get creative with it. Um, yeah. What's your favorite flower, and have you experimented with flowers from abroad? I have not experimented with, with flowers from abroad, and I am as obsessed with King Arthur flower. Yeah. Obsessed. I think it's the best. <laughs> the, just the regular flower. I just use all purpose. Bread. Although someone told me at an event this week she only makes it with bread flour. I need to try. Yeah, because I, yeah, I, have, yeah, I haven't tried it. I've only ever used all purpose. Um, which I think works, I mean, well, taste it and t I mean, tell me, I, I think it works well, but, but I don't know. I don't know. So yeah. When you discuss the community aspect of this, yeah. um, I'm Jewish, you're Jewish, but there are many people in here that are not, and I'm sure in your world in Los Angeles, have you brought in your non-Jewish friends and... I make it every week with, with my Catholic friend. And yeah. How do they because they take this ritual on into their world. Well, I find that particularly for, for people who, who have any kind of faith based or spirituality mm -hmm. in their life, this transcends all of that. So it's, it's such a good question because this is not just a book for Jewish women making challah on Fridays. It's really about living with intention and having this, um, being more mindful in your life. And so I have now, I mean, well, I, do, I make it with this friend Aaron and have for years now who's Catholic. Um, but actually, as a result of the book being out, it's been out for two months. And I have gotten so many um, fun comments and, and reviews and engagement with, with non -Jew, with more probably non Jews have actually uh, Amazon reviews or, or what, or, or commenting that they're, they're embracing this because it speaks to so many broader issues. A bringing community mm -hmm. and people across, yeah. you know. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Um, Hi. I'm a transplant from Los Angeles, and I'm kind of a self appointed critic of the hollows in the Bay Area. <laughs> <laughs> and even though you haven't deviated from your recipe, I can't help but think that you've come across hollows that you found that you haven't made that are better than others. And like all yeah. bread, it's in baked goods, some are much better than yeah. others. And because there are very few ingredients in hollow, it's all about balance. So have you, either in your own baking or when you've tried other halas that have really impressed you, have you found out what those? There seems to be a lot of play in terms of right there, how much sugar are you adding mm -hmm. and the kind of flour, back to your question. Some people make hala with butter. We actually keep kosher at home. So I'm, I'm not going to make it with butter because, well, I, the recipe says oil, and so I started with oil, so I wouldn't have even thought butter. But, but once I heard about butter, I wouldn't do that because I don't want to then serve chicken for dinner and can't mix the milk and the meat thing. But, but I think it's, the, it's little things like that, but they have a dramatic impact because you're right, all hollow is not created equal. Mm -hmm. They really do taste different. Yeah. And a related yeah. question, do you weigh your flour or just I don't it? because I'm just, yeah, I don't. But so I, but I if I were serious about it, I probably would. And I bought a scale. I was all set. I was so excited. I was going to weigh it. And I just, I look at the scale every week. I haven't <laughs> done it yet. No. Keep it simple. I know, yeah. right? I just, it's full, the recipe's foolproof. Yeah. It's really just foolproof. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, what kind of oil do you use? I use canola oil. And I'm now obsessed, actually, with this one that Jeannie has. It's the same one I use. Um, I, it's organic. It's, it's uh, non-GMO. It's like all the, all the good stuff. But I, I wanted a neutral oil. So that's what I had in our kitchen 10 years ago. So that's what I used. But the recipe just said vegetable oil. And 
I have tried other oils. So I've tried. I have not, but someone just actually, I have to do that because uh, yeah, someone just told me to grapeseed, grapeseed. Yeah. Um, I tried olive oil because I was out one day of, <laughs> that didn't work. Um, a friend of mine tried canola oil, that didn't work. Someone I know tried avocado oil as well, that didn't work. So I don't know, I, I, I'm back to the basic. But grapeseed might be great because it's, even, it's so neutral and has such a high, um, so yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Were you ever, did your baking ever extend beyond Halloween? Um, <laughs> just a little bit, not real. I mean, I make an olive oil cake at Hanukkah. I, <laughs> no. I cook, I love to cook. I cook most nights, but I don't really bake. It's you, you do for the most part, if my understanding is correct, and speak up if you're bakers, but my understanding is you have to be really precise, and you probably are weighing things and measuring, and, like, and, and I just kind of scoop, and like, I don't know. So yeah. What is the difference between kneading once or kneading twice? Do we get a lighter bread, a heavier bread? What's the kneading? Yeah. Rising, 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 you know, yeah. whatever. What if yeah. you do it once, she does it twice. What's, what's the different outcome? Well, the... the not the kneading. You say you do one of the Right. Rising. Oh, so you're talking about the right. I think you... The, well, there are two things... Right, there are two things going on there. If you... The, there's the, the kneading and then letting it rise again. I, I do one rise. Why, why, so, why versus Because Abby, that's what Abby did the first day. And so <laughs> it comes back to Abby. Um, I know. But, but it works. It's great. If you, if you do a second, and I tried it once just because I... The, one, the main reason that I do the one rise is time. I, I don't want to spend all, the, all day doing this. And I didn't want to initially. It was, it was about have Part of the benefit of, of when you pick when you have a ritual that, that you want to do a lot, is it's got to be simple and sustainable and easy to do. And so I didn't want to spend all day in the kitchen kneading dough. So when Abby said, I've got this recipe, it's really simple, and it takes an hour and a half to rise, I'm like, I'm in. I get that. Um, you can do a second rise, and it'll, it'll, be, it'll, be, it'll, it'll just be larger and, and more probably fluffier. maybe fluffier. I don't even know. I did it once, um, but I'm, I'm not going to probably do it again because <laughs> of the it's a time, and it's like a, the whole point is for me to keep doing it. And if I have to spend all day doing it, I'm probably not going to keep doing it. So, yes? I was going to ask you, can't the yeast, do you just buy a packet of yeast? Well, I used to just get these. Right, I used to just buy the packets. But I, but I write in the book about now, I, I really like, I buy bulk yeast from Amazon. And a Red Star. Um, I love it. First of all, it's really cool, and it just looks really cool, and I think that's neat. Um, and it lasts a year. It's the most amazing thing. It doesn't matter how many halas I make. It lasts. I like. I, I every November I'm buying a new. I mean, it actually is. It's good for two years. But I mean, but I, I use it up in a year. But it's it's two and a quarter teaspoons of the bulk that I use, which is the same amount as as a packet of of yeast. So I just was always thinking I didn't have these. I couldn't find them in my kitchen cabinet somewhere, and it was frustrating. So when a friend said, "Oh, don't you know about bulk yeast?" I was like. That's brilliant. No, I don't know about bulk yeast. And so now that's why I do that. But these are great, and I used them this morning, and I think they work really well. So, How long yeah. do you need for um, The recipe said the first time 10 minutes, and I didn't know how to knead or what any of that meant. So um, I basically knead until it feels right, which is not a great answer because I'm not telling you exactly, but it's the touch. You really do know, and I feel like I'm need I, I, my favorite sentence in the whole book is, I need for my needs. And I feel like I really do. Like, I just, so, I don't want to ruin that, but, but, but. I heard that you touch your ear like this. <coughs> oh, is that, and that's you, the, that's how you know? That's the, what is the, 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 the yeah. if you touch your ear low, that's soft. Yeah. Like, so, right, I need till it gets, yeah. it's soft, but it's not sticky. Right. So, another lesson that I've learned is that, um, just like everything else in life, you can, you can, um, Add too much of something, it's hard to take it. So I, I, the recipe says four cups of flour, two cups before when you're mixing all the ingredients, and then two cups after you've added the, the yeast and the water. And to the point about the kneading, I add now probably about a cup and a half of flour the second time. And then I start playing around as I'm kneading. I usually do end up adding that extra quarter or half a cup. But some weeks, just like in life, some weeks you need a little bit more. Mm -hmm. 
a fill in the blank. And some weeks you don't. And so I don't always add. It's just how the dough feels. And the dough feels very different for me now, for example, in Los Angeles than it did in Cleveland. Um, I think my dough, like me, had seasonal affective disorder. It's probably more like the water was. Do you feel like your um, well, do you feel also weather and how yeah. Yeah. Every, yeah. It all changes. Yeah. Weather can change in the dough, even in the same city. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Do you, have you ever had it where you're, you're, you do exactly your ritual? And oh, yeah. Is oh, yeah. It, the two batches that I made this morning were, felt different to me. One, the one that's plain felt, is different than, the, so the, the two plain hollows that, so one you can see, um, felt one way, and the two that are, the one that was cinnamon and the one that were raisin felt, felt different. Yeah, so you're right. It can even be in the same, same. Yes. What, what, so what do you mean by warm place? What? Warm, somewhere warm. Like oh, and to rise, degrees, yeah. 65, 70. Are you talking about the when I put it to, to rise? Wait, which part are you? I just put it somewhere warm to rise. I like to put it outside, actually, in the sun. But if you had a proofing drawer, you could put it in that. If you had, and I, or if I'm running the, the uh, dishwasher, I'll put it on the kitchen on the counter by the dishwasher. But the dough likes likes the warmth, and it rises much um, to your point about rising and like how big it gets and whatever. If you put it somewhere warm, you, it's amazing how much larger larger it will be. So I do, I do do that. Yeah. Have you ever played with uh, whole wheat? Or yeah, like miserably, you know? unfortunately. <laughs> but um, I, well, because I was afraid to vary the recipe itself, I just worked with this recipe and I tried whole wheat because I thought this is absurd. I'm telling my patients to get away from white, this, white, that, white, whatever, and here I am making white bread. So I'll try whole wheat, but it tasted, it was awful. I tried half and a quarter, like I tried all the different permutations. I have had some wonderful whole wheat and they're great recipes, and they're great gluten-free recipes, and they're great, I've learned vegan recipes, I didn't even know, but, but they're all these wonderful challah recipes. Um, this one, I at least was complete, I completely failed at trying to make this one whole wheat, but maybe somebody could make it work, I don't know. But yeah, there are great whole wheat challah recipes, yeah. I just figured ultimately that everything in moderation, it would be okay. If I couldn't <laughs> get this to work, I went back to this. Yeah, and you're having a few pieces of hollow a week. Like, it's, yeah, no, yeah. Have you adopted any other rituals in your life other than hangout making, like this whole transcendent path? Yeah. Um, Not specifically. What I have found is that I'm much more aware during the week as a result. And I, I, I find myself pausing a lot more and being more mindful of whatever the activity is. Because I now know, just as I was talking about with the adding the flour, like sometimes you maybe need a little bit more this week. Or when you're talking about the rising and the waiting, and sometimes you need a little bit more patience. So what's fun for me is to then be, be aware of what, what I'm recognizing in, during the week that all comes back to what I've learned making the hala. I do find that. Yeah. yeah. I had a question about the salt. Does it matter? I noticed you don't use kosher salt. Does it matter, like, one salt versus another? I know some have iodine, some Yeah. Have well, I'm a big fan if you have I I, I, I think iodine's important. Um, so I usually use um, just the Morton's in the blue okay. canister because it's okay. what I grew up with. Um, I did try and play around with some of the kosher salts, but depending on which ones you use, you'll really alter your, your recipe. Okay. So I just stick with the basic Morton's. Okay. Yeah, it's a good question. Yeah? Can the sugar be like a light brown, or does it need to be like white? I just use, yeah, I just use the basic cane sugar. Um, I do think you could probably play around with it. I haven't tried, other than I, I do sometimes play around with adding honey at Rosh Hashanah, and then I'll pull back on some of the other. Um, but it changes the texture, so then you have to start thinking about, about that. The sugar is part of the texture. Well, if, if you start adding honey, which is viscous, it's gonna, it makes the dough f- a lot stickier, and then I have to compensate in another, in another way. 
um, at the at other items that you're talking about, like the apples or other things, you yeah. put back on sugar, or just leaves the same? Uh -uh. It's the New Year. Sweet is good. Like I just, I add it all in. I make a really crazy apple honey challah. I use this dough, but I, it's a different shape and recipe. To I add a lot is of honey. That, in your book? that one is not. I, oh, the, the recipe's in the book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it'll walk you right through how to do it if you've never done it. Yeah, it's a step by step. Yeah. My son eats challah um, daily for mm -hmm. his um, breath, for his, his sandwich. My problem is trying to, he's 10, and I've tried to move him to a healthier challah because, because he eats so much of it, I don't have the time to make it, nor do I make it. So I can't, I don't know if this is a medical question or a psychological question, I can't <laughs> seem to get him to switch to a healthier challah when I started buying one that his piano teacher made that was so amazing and seemed so much healthier. And now I'm like concerned after hearing you speak that the one I'm purchasing is maybe not as healthy as it should be. And the intake of Paula is, I mean, it's not that he's like vegetarian, it's all, it's really, he lives on Paula. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know yeah. how to switch. <laughs> yeah. I probably wouldn't rock the boat at this point. <laughs> yeah. 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 My son is 15 and a half. Yeah. I get the Paula every pregnant. I do not make it, I have <laughs> made it. but. I haven't figured out how to make yeah. mine, so maybe I'm going to try yours to match my taste bud. He's 15 and a half, and to this day, Friday night, he eats pretty much, he doesn't like the crust part, he likes the inside part. Oh. He will eat almost an entire loaf himself, oh and I'm okay with it. <laughs> I'm really okay yeah. with it, because the art of it, for me, we don't cut it, and I'm ultra-reform, and my husband isn't even Jewish, and Carolyn knows a lot more about this than from a couple days ago. But we put it on the table, we tear it apart together, or we pull it apart, and that's just how it is. And as my doctor said, and I love organic, I have my own garden, I'm pretty pure, but he's 15 and a half, and if that's what he's gonna eat, and he's active, and he's eating vegetables, or av my avocados, whatever he's eating, they need to eat. And I mean, that's my philosophy. I'm not a doctor. But it hasn't hurt him, and he's not overweight, and he's a big tennis player, and he's still getting my brain, so. <laughs> I like it. And he's happy, and he's happy even more important. So what's the brand? Oh, oh. I like Drager's. I've done a huge ta ta um, taste test. They will not give out their recipe. I think what they do, though, because I, I, I like to um, do this kind of stuff, too, is I think they double ri make it um, rise twice. Yes. Yeah because it's, it's very um, fluffy, but they do a different egg wash over because it's very brown all over. I just haven't figured that one out. So I'm gonna take your recipe. Give it a go, no, give it a go. It's so easy. Yeah, it's very easy. a quick plug for a good egg. Yeah. I'll let you know if you are on one of these notes. Is it crazy? That's like a word about it. It's a secret. If, if, yeah. if it's, yeah. If there are no other questions, I do want to leave you with one thought, and that is that while challah for me is my meaningful ritual, I don't actually really care what your meaningful ritual is. I care that you have a meaningful ritual. So maybe you're a gardener, or maybe you're a knitter, or maybe you're a, a salsa dancer, I just met one. I mean, it doesn't matter what you do, but to be mindful of something in your life that you can do repeatedly, I think is really important. And maybe yeah, <laughs> the tactile, yeah. I like that too. <laughs> yeah, if I, if I could write the perfect prescription. Right, <laughs> right. Um, but that's what I really want to leave you all with today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.